G'day guys, Chris Story here. Today in this podcast, I'll be exploring what the big deal is about veteran leadership, and I'll be going through some case studies demonstrating it's a bigger deal than you realize. So the four teams I'll be covering off, so we've got Carlton, Melbourne, Gold Coast, and Greater Western Sydney. So firstly, starting off with Carlton. So we'll go through year, ladder finish at the end of the home and away season, and then also some keynotes. So in 2002, so they finished 16th of 16 teams. So in that year, Brett Radden takes over captaincy from Craig Bradley, and they're the second oldest list in the competition. So already that's not a good position to be in. And making things even worse, Carlton had picks 1, 2, 31, and 34 stripped in the 2002 draft due to salary cap violations. So starting from that position, it is a hard position to start from, but I'll progress through with Carlton's story. So 2003, they finished 15th of 16 sides. So in 2003, Ratton shares captaincy with Andrew McKay, and they're the third oldest list in the competition. So again, it's a hard position to be in. When you're that old, that terrible of a team, you're losing early picks, it's going to take a while to progress as a team. So... Um, the, the coming years will be as you'd expect with that information in mind. So in 2003, Carlton's first and second round picks were also stripped due to the salary cap violation, but Carlton were awarded pick two as a priority pick, which turned out to be Andrew Walker. So in 2004, they actually make a jump up to 11th place. So Kuda takes over as captain And interestingly, he's the only player aged over the age of 29. And they reduce their age down to only be the 12th oldest list in the competition. So feels like progress, but they didn't really have much of a core in place at this stage, as you'll figure out pretty quickly by the upcoming results. So in 2005, Carlton finished 16th, again of 16 teams. So, and Kuda was the only player aged older than 30. So again, you don't really have that. And then they become the 16th oldest in the competition. So here they've cut ties with a lot of their older players. They've really sort of cleaned house and they're really looking to start from fresh. So let's see how this concept works for them. So I could have started from this point, but I really wanted to give a bit of a background as to how far back Carlton were coming from, but also did their methodology work. So moving on to the 2006 season. So Carlton finished 16th of 16 sides and they have the 14th oldest list in the competition. 2007, they come 15th of 16 sides. Lance Whitnell takes over as captain, but there's only two players aged older than 27. So we're looking at a list without any veteran experience. So, and then of course, they're just the 14th oldest list in the competition. So very young, this might be have an impact on their youth development, I would suspect. 2008, they come 11th of 16. So how does that happen? Well, it's Chris Judd's first year with Carlton. So they pull off the blockbuster trade. Chris Judd thinks he can join a potential premiership team and help with the development of their young players. So let's see how that works out for them. So still, we've got a list dynamic where there's no players older than the age of 28, and they've got the 16th oldest list in the competition. So... By this point in time, there was a level of expectation that with a core including names such as Judd, Murphy, Gibbs, Cruiser, and Walker, that a premiership would be on the cards as this group matured and their young players became stars. So, of course, within that group, well, Murphy, Gibbs, and Cruiser, they were all pick ones, and Walker was a pick two. So, they're some big names, and they had other first round picks as well. It wasn't just those guys. So the expectations were extraordinarily high at this point for Carlton and what they could achieve in the future. So 2009, so seventh of 16. So, but even at this time, there's only one player aged 29 or older, which is Nick Stevens. And they've got the 11th oldest list in the competition. So again, don't have that core of veteran leadership. Could that be impacting the youth? 2010, they come eighth of 16. So... Again, the only there's only one player aged 29 or older, which is Heath Scotland, and they have the 13th oldest list in the competition. 
2011. They come fifth of 17 teams. So, of course, this is the year Gold Coast is introduced in the, into the competition. So, again, even here, they only have one player aged 30 or older. So, that's not going to bode well come finals time, and that's not going to help too much with their youth development. And at this point, they have the 11th oldest list in the competition. So, there's a, a concentration building of sort of your mid-career types by this point in time. So 2012, they come 10th of 18. So we start to see a bit of a dip here. So maybe that lack of youth development and the lack of veteran leadership may have played a part here, I suspect. So in 2012, so you've only got one player aged 29 or older, and you've got here the, the 10th oldest list in the competition. So they're starting to get older, but again, they haven't had those veterans in place to help with the youth development and allow them to maximize their potential. So 2013, Carlton come 8th of 18. So, and then you've got Mark Murphy takes over as captain, and they've got the 8th oldest list in the competition. So they're starting to age, but they haven't ever really been able to develop the, I guess, core of young talent necessary to really build up a premiership contender. So 2014, 2014 they come 13th of 18. And in this year... Chris Judd only plays 12 games, so it's really the beginning of the end for him. And they've got the second oldest list in the competition. 2015, they come 18th of 18. So really it's become incredibly clear and obvious that the rebuild has completely failed. So, um, And in this season, Chris Judd has his final year and he just plays the eight games. So... He was completely shot by this point, it's fair to say. So, and at this stage, they've got the seventh oldest list in the competition. So they really sort of have figured out, look, we need to get a bit younger. It's not working with this group. Let's get a bit a bit younger because it's not really going to go anywhere. So a bit of a shame for Carlton there, but it's the way it went just because they didn't have that support in terms of the veterans. So you've got 2016 now. So they come 14th of 18 sides. They've got the seventh oldest list in the competition. 2017, they come 16th of 18, ninth oldest list in the competition. 2018, 18th of 18 sides, 14th oldest list in the competition. So really trying more aggressively now to get young. 2019, they come 16th of 18. And here we've got a bit of a leadership change. So we've got Patrick Cripps and Sam Doherty take over as co-captains. And they've got the 16th oldest list in the competition. So... And after this point, they're really going to try and start building forward. And I think around this point is actually where Carlton are starting to show the right signs, where there are those core names where you've got the likes of your Cade Simpson, who's still around there to support the likes of your Cripps and Doherty. So here we're starting to get a few more senior players in place and things potentially could become more positive. So then in 2020, they come 11th of 18 sides and they're the 14th oldest list in the competition. And then in 2021, they're 13th at this stage of the 18 sides. And this is 18 rounds into the season at the time of producing this. So, and for the 11th oldest list in the competition. So to go through their early pick history. So 2003, we had pick two, Andrew Walker. He was a pretty good player, but did have his injury issues. Um, in 2004, we had pick nine, Jordan Russell. So he was a disappointment, ended up going to Collingwood, didn't really finish off his career strongly. Showed some early signs, but never developed for Carlton and lost his pace. Um, 20, 2005, pick one, Mark Murphy. Pick four, Josh Kennedy, who of course was shipped in that trade for Chris Judd. And also in going through these picks, just to make it clear, I'm only including top 15 picks. I look at that as a rough cutoff point where you're expecting top 15 picks really to become guns, really, ultimately. So Kennedy, of course, great success with um, West Coast. Mark Murphy, very good player, but not the best in his draft. 2006, pick one, Bryce Gibbs. Again, good player, good career, but there were many better players in that draft. And then same story could be said of um, in 2007, pick one, Matthew Cruiser. So... We've got those, what should have been really the core pieces to a premiership there, but it didn't eventuate. And you can see a similar story with the next few picks and not really living up to their draft billing. 
So in 2008, pick six, Chris Yaron. 2009, pick 12, Kane Lucas. So he didn't last all that long. And the same could be said about their 2012 pick 11 in Troy Menzel. But where things have started to pick up for Carlton in terms of actually being able to develop their youth and see those high picks actually become reasonable talents, well, here in 2013, they really nailed it with pick 13 and Patrick Cripps. So this is the start of a more positive outlook, hopefully, for Carlton. So 2015, pick one, Jacob Wiedering. So strong pick, can't argue with that. Pick 10, Harry McKay, looking good. And then pick 12, Charlie Kerno. So before the injuries looked exceptional, lived up to that sort of billing, but yeah, unfortunately we'll just have to sort of see how he recovers from here. But again, within those years, at least we're getting some good pieces here. Um, 2016, pick six, um, Sam Procheski seaton So he could possibly be on the trade block at the end of the year, but at least he's shown some talent, but probably hasn't quite developed to expectation. 2007 pick three, Paddy Dow. So showed some signs, but he's not a pick three. Pick 10, Lockie O'Brien hasn't developed. Um, not looking likely at this stage, but he may get another year possibly. We'll have to see if Carlton give him an extra year. And then, of course, in 2018, pick one, Sam Walsh. So that's a successful pick. So then to draw some conclusions. So what we can take out of Carlton's story. So... Pretty depressing that Carlton have really been unable to take a team that included three pick ones in the likes of Murphy, Gibbs, and Cruiser. And that was a group, of course, led by Chris Judd, and they couldn't even make it into a top four spot. So, And during those years, as I've gone through in my assessment with Carlton, they just lacked the veteran leadership. They needed those pieces around these young guys to help support their development. There isn't that story of whether it's a Richmond with a Troy Chaplin being there for an Alex Rands to develop. There's none of that mentorship or looking at those great teams. And I'll go through these in a future video. But when you look at those picks or those players that have really far exceeded their pick, you can really see a consistent theme of you've actually got all these veteran leaders around them that have enabled them to develop well beyond any sort of level of expectation and far beyond what the eventual pick one had achieved by going to not such a strong team. So, um, but moving on. So what does this say about the effectiveness of tanking as a concept? So, and my opinion there is sort of looking to secure a number of pick ones. Well, this is a 22 man game. You can't just have one player make the difference. We saw that of course with Gold Coast and Ablett or back in the day for Collingwood, Nathan Buckley, as great as he was, he couldn't carry that team to a premiership and he never really had that great player next to him. So um, one player in AFL football doesn't translate to team success. This isn't the NBA. It's not a five man on the court at the time sort of game. So you really need a lot more than one great player. So even if you have a stockpile of number one picks as Carlton had with Murphy, Gibbs and Cruiser, well, that's not enough. So one early pick in a draft doesn't necessarily develop optimally if um, they go to a team without any sort of veteran leadership or winning culture. So they were the ingredients that were for so long missing from Carlton. So at least they're at a stage where they should be quite a way past there and at least some of their picks in sort of the last eight or so years have been a lot more successful. So um, at least they've turned that around. But really, I guess that period 10 years ago or so, it's disappointing to see at least that previous group not be able to have success given all those number one picks that you'd assume would go on and have that success. So, yeah, so we've seen really since Carlton's era of tanking ended, greater success in their development of their youth, which really shouldn't come as a surprise. And with a strengthening leadership group and core of established players over recent seasons. So they're the key ingredients that we've really seen in, I guess, the more gradual, more recent improvement with Carlton. So, and what I'd even say of Carlton's list on the positive side at this point in time, well, I, I, I think with their present group, they could really become a top eight side maybe even as soon as next year. So that's something to look to. Because at a stage where they've gone from the 16th oldest, 14th oldest, 11th oldest, they've got enough players who have been exposed to some able veterans who have been around 
a long time. They've got a few leaders developing. So you've obviously got Crips and Doherty developed. You've got Walsh coming through. So there are those emerging leaders also that also play a part. But having had the likes of a Cade Simpson, well, all those things sort of help. And a Mark Murphy, of course, who's been a capable leader for a long time. And before that, they had Cruiser and Gibbs, who obviously had that experience for a long time as those former high picks. So I think the ingredients are there for Carlton now, at least, to start sort of making those strides. And I'd even say probably next year, I'd even suggest I'd predict them to be a top eight side, assuming a good injury run and continued development of their youth. So we'll see what happens there. But moving on to our second team, so Melbourne. So, of course, they had a long sustained period where they had trouble. So, um, so starting from 2007, so their ladder finish was 14th of 16, and they had the fourth oldest list in the AFL. So it was a bad situation, not quite as dire as Carlton's where they were having all those picks stripped and they had nothing in the way of talent. But again, when you've got a bad team that's old, it's a hard position to start from. And particularly in this pre-sort of free agency era, where free agency obviously is coming in more recent years and you can top up through other lists a lot easier. But um, of course, during these times, it was a lot harder. And then of course, a few years later, we'd have our new teams in Gold Coast and Greater Western Sydney join the competition. So 2008, so Melbourne finished 16th of 16 teams. They had the eighth oldest list in the AFL and Dean Bailey became coach. So in 2009, again, they finished 16th of 16 teams and they had the 15th oldest list in the AFL. 2010, so this is where they at least start to make some strides. So they come six, uh, sorry, they come 12th of 16 teams. They've got the 15th oldest list in the competition. And the assumption really at this point in time was after the additions of, you've got the likes of Jack Watts, you've got Tom Scully, you've got Jack Trengrove, um, you'd really be thinking that that'd really be the primary components of a premiership side on a list really that would be contending. And you've also got, in addition to those, I guess, top two picks, the so two pick ones and a pick two, you've still got on the total list, you've got 17 top 20 picks at this point in time. So you'd really be thinking, gee, there should really be a substantial amount of development here from this group. But it's not to be, and we'll see why in a moment. So in 2011, so they come 13th of 17. So again, Gold Coast joined the competition. The next year we'll have Greater Western Sydney. So, um, And at this point, so they've really cleaned out their list here. So Brad Green is the oldest player on their list. And so he's the only player over 29, and he's a 30-year-old. So here they've got the 16th oldest list in the AFL. So really Melbourne aren't doing themselves any favours by having such an incredibly young list without anything in the way of veteran presences. And as we'll see with the lack of development to their youth, we'll really see what the problems are. So 2012, so they come 16th of 18 sides. So again, Brad Green's the oldest as a 13, a 31 year old, and he's the only player older than 29. So that's pretty poor there. So we've got Jack Trengrove and you've got Jack Grimes prematurely named as co-captains. So you had um, Trengrove as the youngest ever at that time and then Grimes also far too young for that responsibility. So they were really being sort of thrown into the positions and as we know from what would eventuate with their careers, well, they both got cut ultimately a few years later and they never developed into the players they really could have possibly become. And a big part of that was they were thrust into the leadership positions too early and they weren't given the opportunity to develop with any sort of older players there to help guide their development. So that was a real shame there. But again, at this stage, 15th oldest list in the AFL and Mark Neild became coach that year. So, and of course with Mark Neild, so of course you had, I guess what you could describe as the tanking era under Dean Bailey. Well, you had Mark Neild come in and give it a go, but then you had a playing group also that just didn't respond at all well to him as coach. So that was a further problem that exacerbated the lack of development in addition to the lack of veteran leadership. So um, 2013, so again, we've, they've come 17th of 18 teams. So again, another poor result. 
and all players are aged under 30. So this is how dire their situation is in Melbourne. So you've got Jack Trengrove and Grimes remain co-captains. They've got the 14th oldest list in the AFL, so still very young, but again, they just lack anything in the way of veteran leaders. And it would come back to bite them because as we know from this group, there wasn't really any meaningful player development. So then we move on to 2014. So Melbourne comes 17th of 18 teams and Nathan Jones joins Jack Grimes in the role of co-captain. So this is a move forward. And also importantly, they add Daniel Cross and Bernie Vince as some veteran leadership from other teams. And they, they're still the 14th oldest list in the competition, but um, Paul Ruse becomes coach and he helps turn things around. So adding in some veteran leaders, putting Jones as he really should have been into the captain responsibility, that's looking a bit better. So 2015, they come 13th. So here we're getting some upward progression. So in this year, Nathan Jones takes over as the solo captain, and they've got the 11th oldest list in the competition. So they're starting to let their players mature, and they've, they've got a good coach in place. So things are starting to look a bit better, and they're starting to take a few steps in the right direction at least. So 2016, so they come 11th out of 18. Again, progression. So that's something, but even at this stage, Bernie Vince is the only player aged 30 or older. So... Again, you'd really want a bit more than that if you're trying to develop a young list. So, And of course, at this point, they've got the 16th oldest list in the AFL, so very young. But with that, at least you've got the, I guess, possibility to develop them. So um, we'll have to see how that goes. So 2017, they come ninth of 18 teams. So that's progress. So... You've got Jack Viney. He joins Nathan Jones as co-captains. So that's a more than reasonable choice. And this is a really important point here. Jordan Lewis is added as additional veteran leadership during this season. So having him there, this is a point in time where it actually quite substantially helped with the youth development. Where we're, we're looking at a Jordan Lewis as someone where he was in the mix to be a Hawthorne captain. He was a key leader there. So adding that to Melbourne, exceptionally important and a point that shouldn't be missed. So, and in this year, they have the 12th oldest list in the AFL. So starting to mature. And this was also Simon Goodwin's first year as coach. So, and he joined on as coach at the exact right time because all those veteran pieces were coming into place. You've got Paul Ruse who established a culture there. You've got two capable co-captains in Viney and Jones. So things are starting to look up. And again, the veteran leadership is that consistent theme here. So 2018, Melbourne come fifth of 18 teams. So again, the upward progression, which shouldn't be surprising. And here they've got the ninth oldest list in the AFL. 2019, well, this was a big slip and an unexpected one at that after Melbourne's successful 2018 season, but they come 17th of 18 teams. And they've got the 13th oldest list in the competition. 2020, they come 9th out of 18, so this is better progression. Um, Max Gorn becomes captain, and they've got the 9th oldest list in the AFL. So. And then, of course, this year, so 18 rounds in, Melbourne are sitting first on the ladder out of the 18 teams. They've got the 6th oldest list in the AFL, so they're starting to get older, but we've also really seen the maturation of their youth, which, again, if we're to look at the... I guess, core young players that have really come through. It's really been, I guess, from that Paul Ruse era and onwards when Melbourne have really established that group of veteran leaders. So again, I'll go through those early picks with Melbourne again in a moment, as I have with Carlton. So here we've got with Melbourne, five players aged 30 or older. So we're really seeing that core of veteran leaders here to really drive this group forward. So And we've really got a core of the list as aged 23 and older, placing Melbourne's list really in that competitive age demographic range, which is which is allowing Melbourne's younger players to emerge this year. And of course, we've really seen it with the emergence of Cozzy Pickett, who frankly is playing a near all Australian standard of football. So he's going great. You've got Luke Jackson, he's emerged and he's even taking some ruck minutes from Max Gorn. James Jordan, he's really progressed this year substantially. I didn't think he'd be if he was going to be best 22 anywhere near this standard. And then, of course, Trent Rivers, he continues to improve too. So 
Um, and they've really done all this while also, and with the, this core of veteran leadership, it's really sort of aided in the development of those who are sort of aged in their mid twenties as well. So if you look through those names as well, but um, early pick history. So this is what Melbourne have had over time. And we can really see, I guess, the progressive improvement as they've really had those veteran leaders. So in 2007, so they had pick four, Kale Morton. So that wasn't a successful pick. And then they had pick 14, which was Jack Grimes. So Grimes had early success and he even became a co-captain. But he's one where really, I guess, he got cut early and he just didn't develop to the level that really anyone expected based on those early signs. So um, disappointing outcome in the end. But again, with the likes of Morton and Grimes, well, you needed those veteran leaders around him. And it becomes even more obvious with the next pick. So 2008, pick one, Jack Watts. So everyone's aware of his talent, but he really never was able to develop that confidence with Melbourne. And the burden of expectation of being a pick one really hurt him. So, and had he gone to a more successful club, I think we'd be talking about a completely different player. But joining Melbourne at that age and stage in their development cycle, it just didn't work out for him. And that's part of the reason why we see so many pick ones, even though they're often the most talented or certainly one of the most talented, it doesn't always quite work out as you'd expect. And that lack of veteran leadership plays a big part in that. So 2009, pick one, Tom, Tom Scully. So another pick one. Pick two was Jack Trengrove. And pick 11 was Jordan Gisbert. So he was out of the competition pretty quickly. So 2010, pick 12, Lucas Cook. So, and again, these guys all came in during the tanking era. So it shouldn't be a surprise that Scully and Trengrove never became those elite players. And it shouldn't be a surprise that Gisbert and Cook were out of the competition so quickly. This happens when you're going to a bad team that doesn't have a culture, doesn't have those veteran leaders in place and just have that sort of, I guess, losing culture, losing mentality that they're just going to tank every year. So tanking doesn't work, folks. So we've got 2012, pick four, Jimmy Tompas. So really talented, but yeah, never made the grade. Couldn't develop that contested ball winning capability. But then we move on to 2013, pick nine, Christian Salem. So this is a successful pick. And it directly correlates with, I guess, the following years. So what happens in the next year? Well, we've got um, Paul Ruse becoming coach. So Christian Salem joins on right when Paul Ruse becomes coach. So that's a big thing. And also at the same time, when some key veteran leaders were coming in. And we see a continuation of improved success here for Melbourne. So 2014, pick two, Christian Petrarca. Pick three, Angus Brayshaw. So again, much improved on the picks they were having in those earlier years. 2015, pick four, Clayton Oliver. Great success, great pick. Pick nine, Sam Wiedemann. Look, is not as successful, but not every pick is a success. But we can certainly see a big difference. So Wiedemann, he's more successful than Lucas Cook. And you've got Oliver, he's more successful than the likes of Scully and Trengrove. So, and then 2019, pick three, Luke Jackson. So he's developing. And again, you've got the core pieces around him, all those veterans. That's going to help. And same with pick 12, Cozzy Pickett. Again, having those veteran leadership, that, that's big. So what can we learn from Melbourne's story? So like with Carlton, tanking didn't help them. And having two successive pick ones, having three top two picks in two years, it doesn't help when you don't have the core of veteran leaders in place to support their development. And when you've got a high-end coach in Paul Ruse come in and turn things around, again, that helps as well. And same with when he's bringing in incapable veteran leaders. So, and that's really when we started to see that young player development. So um, there's really a clear cut reason why the likes of Kale Morton, Jack Watts, Tom Scully, Jack Trengrove, and I know Scully wasn't there at Melbourne for too long, but nonetheless, his early success could have been better there when he was on Melbourne's list. And then of course, Jimmy Tompas. So all those guys as former top five picks. Well, if you're to redo any of those drafts, you're not putting any of them anywhere near the top five. So... Um, and that's really why none of them lived up to their draft billing. Whereas on the other hand, well, you've got the likes of in more recent years, Christian Salem, Christian Petrarca, 
Clayton Oliver. So their top 10 pick successes. And that was, again, during that sort of Paul Ruse sort of coaching tenure and onwards. So, and really sort of in a period where they really deliberately brought in capable veteran leaders and they no longer required the likes of an inexperienced Trengrove and Grimes who weren't stars that necessarily players would be following in that sort of respect. So, and really this transition to, I guess, a model where there are more veteran leaders and there is really that winning culture. That transition is what directly helped, in my opinion, Melbourne's youth and mid-age players to continue continue developing in this Simon Goodwin era that we've seen post Paul Ruse. So next up, moving through Gold Coast. So in 2011, they came 17th of 17 teams. So unsurprisingly, the 17th oldest list in the competition, and their average age is 21.3 years. So about as young as you can get. So no players older, no players 30 years of age or older. And of course, Gary Ablett was brought in to be the franchise player and captain. And even at the peak of his powers, he couldn't drag this team along past 17th place. So that really speaks to the limitations of the powers of just one player in a football game. Because in terms of Gary Ablett's peak, well, it's up there with the very best ever to play in the AFL. So only five players from the original team remain as of 2021 season. So the only ones to remain from this point are David Swallow, Sam Day, Jared Harbrow, who's really at the end. So you've got Zach Smith, who returned because he wasn't getting games elsewhere, and then Rory Thompson. So, And so Gold Coast have really in their time struggled with player retention and those that they've retained well they're not exactly superstars with really David Swallow the only real I guess capable piece remaining of those I guess you could say with the likes of Harbrow really done ultimately and Sam Day very much underwhelming Zach Smith certainly isn't sort of a key piece and Rory Thompson is sort of a mediocre key defender who I guess you could say is passable defensively but really he isn't I guess someone you'd really want to have as your best key defender or the best piece in your defense you could say with confidence so with Gold Coast at this point of time in 2011 of course so they had a lack of players aged between 21 and 25 so only 12 which by far and away is the least in the competition as really an age group there's typically a very high concentration of players of so with this being the case, it really made things hard for Gold Coast to develop. So, And with that also in mind, so in that age group, you only had Michael Riscatelli, Jared Harbrow, and Nathan Cracker, the only players to really come in with any sort of meaningful expectation from that group. And of course, Cracker a few years later left. So um, just due to sort of, I guess, go home factor. But um, 2012, so... They came 17th of 18 teams. So 17th oldest list, average age of 21.1 years. So, of course, Greater Western Sydney coming in became the youngest. And again, you've got that lack of players aged between 22 and 26, which if Gold Coast wanted to be competitive anytime soon, well, they really needed more numbers in that age group. So again, you've only really got of the notables, Riscatelli, Harbrow and Cracker. So um, Josh Fraser was the only 30-year-old, so at least they've got someone aged 30, although at that stage he was completely shot. And then Aaron Hall was drafted in the preseason draft. So um, he ended up being a positive pick, and I only really name him because at least he became a component to their team and a valuable contributor. So in 2013, they came 14th of 18, so that's progress, and they still had the 17th oldest list in the competition. So given that progress, it was pretty reasonable to be thinking, okay, this team is going to be really good, and the expectation was, yeah, this team could win a premiership or two eventually once all these young players develop, but of course we know a very different story. So um, average age of 22.6 years, And again, there was a distinct lack of players aged between 23 and 27. So with Gold Coast, if they wanted this list to contend, they needed guys in that age group. And again, it was only Riscatelli, Harbrow, and Cracker as those 
I guess, name players. So, and Nathan Bock was the only 30-year-old. So not enough in terms of veteran players either. So just a very young, immature list. And as a result, it's going to be pretty hard for those young players to come on and really meet their expectation. So in 2014, so Gold Coast came 12th of 18. So again, they're still rising. But um, yeah, with still the 17th oldest list in the competition, average age of 22.9 years. And again, you've got that lack of players aged between 24 and 28. So that's really where they needed that core age of players to really, I guess, maximize, I guess, the scope of this group. But again, only having the nine and Risk Italian Harbrow were really the only notables. Cracker by 2014 had left. And at least then they had three aged 30 or older. So that's something. But again, they're still a pretty young group and they don't have those, I guess, key players in that key age group to really drive this group forward. So 2015, so 16 of 18, or they came 16th of 18 teams, so 16th oldest list, so starting to progress in terms of age. Um, but again, the average age of 23.1 years, so again, it's still a very young group, but that's just a slow progression. So, And again, we've got that lack of players, and now moving up that age group, but to, from 25 to 29, again, this should be the time where you'd be expecting Gold Coast have had enough years in the competition. They really should be up there. And they actually brought in, so they brought in um, Melcheski and Broughton. So they added that to, of course, Risk Italian Harbrow. So at least to their credit, they brought in some names, but there was nonetheless a regression by Gold Coast. And why was that? Well, again, they didn't have, I guess, the players in those right age demographics, nor that veteran leadership to really provide the group with support to enable the young guys to develop meaningfully. So, and in this season, only two aged 30 years or older. Um, all others were younger. And then Adam Saad was drafted as a rookie. So again, I mention him just because he was a good player for Gold Coast. And then obviously he had success elsewhere. But again, I just wanted to mention him being a successful piece that they brought in. Just to give that, I guess, timeline as to when some of the key pieces came in for Gold Coast. So 2016, so they came 15th of 18 sides. They had the 15th oldest list in the competition. Average age of 23.5. And there was, again, a lack of players aged between 26 and 30. So only seven. So Matt Rosa was added in the hope that he's a piece. And again, there's only three aged 30 or older. So here in terms of looking at those players where by 2016, you'd be thinking... By now, Gold Coast should be a top four side. They should be contending. Maybe that even be a chance to win a flag, but not so. And again, without those players in the right age group, it's a bit hard to do that. So 2017, so they came 17th of 18 sides. So they're the 15th oldest list, average age of 23.8. And there's a lack of players aged between 27 and 31. So still only eight. So... To their credit, at least they brought in Michael Barlow and Pierce Hanley as notable win now additions, so that's something. And they also acquired Jared Witts and Jared Lyons, and they did so for unders, so they were great moves as well. And Tom Lynch and Stephen May took over as dual captains. So um, with all of that in mind, really there was, I guess, a renewed optimism around what Gold Coast should achieve with those new additions. So and only two aged 30 or above. So again, there was still expectation that Gold Coast should come good, but of course it wasn't as high as those years prior just because there was a lack of um, meaningful player development from their youth. And I'll go through those names a bit later on. So in 2018, they come 17th of 18 sides and 18th oldest list in the competition, average age of 23.1. And of course, this is the year that Ablett rejoined, uh, rejoined Geelong. So leaving Gold Coast with really nothing meaningful in the way of high-end established players. So um, really only the three aged 30 or above. And look, I, I guess you could say the likes of Tom Lynch. Obviously, he was terrific for a number of years there. Stephen May, sure. But look, nonetheless, they just really didn't have enough in the way of really capable high-end pieces. They didn't have the veteran leaders. 
they just really didn't have anything. And really, once Ablett went, well, it was just a new starting over. Despite all those early first round picks they had, it didn't matter in the end. So 2019, they came 18th of 18 sides. So this was really sort of, I guess, when they hit rock bottom. So 18th oldest list, so still very young. Uh, average age of 23.1. And there was just a meaningful list clean out. So Barlow out, Hall out, Lynch out, Lyons out, Stephen May out, Scrimshaw, all of those guys departing. So And really leaving Gold Coast with an entirely uncompetitive group for that season. And of course, both of their captains leaving as well. So in Lynch and May, who were made captains. So, um, And what that left them with? Well, it left Gold Coast with David Spolo and Jared Witz to assume a shared captaincy. So again, not really the guys you want leading a club and really hoping will help develop the youth. So I still do hold substantial questions as to the capability of, I guess, Gold Coast really developing their youth. So... Um, and again, at this stage, so only three aged 30 or above. So it's still a young group, but they also didn't really have those mid to late career guys either. So um, they enjoyed the, I guess, super top end of the draft in 2018. So they secured, of course, Lukosius at two, Rankin at three, Ben King at six. as sort of part of that new core to start building around. But again, with all those key players leaving, well... As we're sort of seeing now with their relative lack of development, Rankin actually just the other week getting dropped. Well, that's a pretty fair sign. Lukosius not being meaningfully better than he was sort of in the second half of his first season in moving back. And of course, with Ben King, well, he's been really good, but he hasn't developed quite at the same rate as Max King, who even with the ACL has really zoomed past him. So, And St Kilda aren't known for player development either at that. So... Um, but one piece that Gold Coast did get, so they did add Sam Collins. So he was a key piece, received sort of thanks to the AFL's concessions and support to Gold Coast, just to allow them to add him as a mature ager, having come out of the state leagues and having had really a dominant season. So, um, And it's interesting, if we go through some of the key names that I've been mentioning who have been added, well, Sam Collins, well, he was a state leaguer. Aaron Hall, he was a state leaguer added as... as through the preseason draft you had jared Lyons, who was traded for received for not a lot so a lot of these players and even you've got adam Saad. well i've mentioned before he was rookied so a lot of the really good players gold coast have gotten they haven't actually been their early picks which is really one of the fascinating things and they're not alone in being the only team to find success sort of through other methods than early picks so but again just with the <clears throat> With the early picks, it's just really been, I guess, a challenge in that they just haven't really ever had that, I guess, those veteran leaders and those guys who are just that little bit older to really support the young guys in their development. So that's always been a real problem for Gold Coast and one that they're still fighting with, unfortunately, all these years later after joining the competition. So in 2020, so they come 14th of 18 sides and they've got the 18th oldest list. So average age of 23.4. And there's a very important addition in Hugh Greenwood from Adelaide. So terrific pickup. He'd be, if not their best, certainly their second best player after Tuke Miller this year. So really valuable player. Defensively about as good as there is. High volume contested. Love his game. One of the most underrated mids in the competition. So 2021. So they come fourth, or they're at least coming 14th at the time of producing this and this is 18 rounds into the season um so they've got as of the time of recording the 16th oldest list so average age of 23.7 and no meaningful list changes so coming into the season and if we're really to go through and assess the success or otherwise of gold coast with their i guess pick conversion well Gold Coast have really been that least successful team in the competition. And why is that? Well, they've never had those players around them to support their development, be it those younger leaders, those veteran leaders. There just hasn't ever been that to support their development. And that's really been the shortcoming that's really led to a lot of these guys, even though they a lot of them have had success early, just never to become those great players that really a lot of them really should have become. So... Um, so their early pick history. So 
Um, before they joined the competition, they had access to 12 17 year olds. So here are some of the names, or all the names for that matter. So they had Trent McKenzie. So of course he had success in season one, really is that long kicking player, but he never really developed for Gold Coast from there. Matt Shaw, he had early success with his run and carry, but again, never developed. Brandon Matera, he played early, showed some early career signs as a small forward, but again, never developed. Another guy, as with Shaw, he's out of the AFL. Luke Russell, he was hyped as a junior, but never developed, never became that best 22 player. Tom Nichols showed some signs through the ruck, athletic, underrated, should have become a best 22 player, if not for Gold Coast, certainly for another team, but that never occurred. Uh, Maverick Weller bounced around for a few teams, but ultimately, despite really a lot of early hype coming in, he really never developed. So, And as with Russell, Weller was really someone where he really showed, I guess, before joining the AFL that he should have been a developable player by AFL standards and become a strong mid, but not so. Josh Toy, one of the absolute best kicks of the footy I've ever seen in my life. But due to heart issues, never developed. So showed signs in year one, but from there, look, he just really couldn't sort of after that sort of improve on his level. And just with heart issues, he couldn't get his heart rate above a certain level to really be able to have a sustainable career at AFL level, unfortunately, in his case. But really talented, but again, someone who didn't develop. Alex Keith, well, he's having success he had success in joining Adelaide, of course, as a Category B rookie, and then now is with the Dogs and having success there too. But um, Keith didn't actually end up joining Gold Coast. He elected to go the cricket route and spent years playing cricket before he came back to the AFL. So Gold Coast never had the opportunity to develop him. And then the next names, Jack Hutchins, Taylor Hine, Hayden Jolly, Piers Flanagan. So all out of the AFL, and of all those 12 players, none of them remain with Gold Coast. And... Gold Coast were really unable to develop any of them meaningfully. Maybe Tom Nichols, you could make a case for they developed him to a pretty good standard. But again, he really never became that best 22 player. And with Wits coming in, well, really, he was never able to establish himself, which is unfortunate in his case. And similar story going through the 2010 picks. So pick one, David Swallow showed great early signs, but... He really should have been a near-generational star, should have become a top five in the competition type mid. That's how he projected coming in. But, of course, didn't eventuate, wasn't the result. Harley Bennell, great in his first two seasons, never progressed from there, had his injuries. So, um, another case, didn't develop. Sam Day, really athletic, showed great signs as a junior. Still, to some extent, a project in some regards, where he wasn't necessarily the most productive, but... Gold Coast couldn't develop him either, despite being a multi-sport sort of hybrid type player, where he's great at basketball, great at baseball, I believe it was as well. But again, Gold Coast really couldn't develop him into a great player. He's still there and one of the few that remains. But um, yeah, for a pick three, well, you, you want a better outcome than what Sam Day became. And he just never developed into that really excellent player. And he's someone where, frankly, on a lot of teams, he wouldn't get games. So... Um, pick seven, Josh Caddy, so never really developed with Gold Coast. He had a year where he was very successful for Richmond, but yeah, never developed to that pick seven sort of level. Um, pick nine, Dion Prestia, he was a success, but he's at Richmond now. So um, yeah, that's a shame there. And player retention. And a lot of these guys are player retention issues. So, um, and that'll be a pretty consistent theme with a lot of these guys as well. Pick 10, Daniel Gorringe, well, he hasn't he's more of a social media star than a football star so um it depends how gold coast measures success there but certainly not in terms of football field success um pick 11 tom lynch great success there and really developed for gold coast and one of those very few rare exceptional cases where gold coast could develop one there and with lynch it was a case of he was a very late bloomer grew very late developed from really a small wing into a very tall key forward and an excellent one at that so with that natural rate of improvement that played a big part and even when he joined Richmond they were sort of saying oh gee this guy is really untapped and there's a lot of sort of scope that hasn't really been developed so even based on that all, all the signs really were that Gold Coast could have developed him even into a better player had they 
really had those veteran pieces, those, I guess, really good players around. So um, although that can really still be looked at as, by all means, an incredibly successful pick and a good attempt at player development, there was still some possible scope to be even greater, which really is staggering to hear. Um, pick 13, Seb Tape, didn't last long as that sort of medium defender. Um, 2011, mini draft pick one, Jager O'Meara. So um, he was really looked at as something like the next Gary Ablett, maybe minus a bit of the forward scope. But although he's a very good midfielder, don't get me wrong, he isn't that number one on team level midfielder, let alone that number one in the competition level contender that was expected. So he, the hope was he could be possibly the best midfielder in the comp. But yeah, not so. Hasn't ever, as, as a bit like with David Swallow being able to get there. And look, he had his injuries for a number of years that hurt him. And he had great success in year one. But he really struggled, at least with Gold Coast, to ever build on that. So, and injuries did play a part for a lot of these Gold Coast players as well, for full disclosure. But nonetheless, you'd really hope for a much greater degree of player development. Um, 2012 mini draft. So, um, it was pick one. So you had Jack Martin and another story where again, not, and as with O'Meara for that matter, no longer at Gold Coast, but didn't really develop there either. So, um, and with a Jack Martin, my projection was at the time of his draft, he could be another Dale Thomas sort of caliber player where he was just that tackling machine, high flyer, really influential player, but yeah, just never developed into that. And really hasn't been able to get past that, I guess, middle-of-the-road piece sort of component to a team. So, um, yeah, disappointing outcome again. And that same year, pick 13, Jesse Lonergan. He's out of the league, never developed as a that sort of big-bodied mid. 2013, um, Jake Collajasny had a good sort of first year or two, but never really developed from there. Had the concussion issues, which, of course, have sort of seen him retire since. But um, yeah, again, another case of early pick hasn't developed. And I wonder why. What's the constant theme here, guys? <laughs> Help me out. So 2014, pick 15, 2014, pick 15 Jared Garlett. So um, go home factor there, but again, didn't develop. Um, so it was 2014. 2015, pick 8, Callum Archie. So again, didn't develop with Gold Coast. Maybe with Brisbane... He could, but yeah, just couldn't develop with Gold Coast. Um, 2016, so pick four, Ben Ainsworth. Pick seven, Jack Scrimshaw. He's only now having success with Hawthorne. Now that he's transitioned over with Gold Coast, he couldn't really get a game. Pick nine, Will Brody. So again, all these names, so many stories of lack of development. And then pick 10, Jack Bowes from their academy. At least he's a piece, so... And Ainsworth is a piece as well, in fairness there. But is he worth a pick four? No. Nah. <laughs> so you've got 2018. Pick two, Jack Lacocious. Best talent I've seen come through the draft in now what is my 13 years covering the draft. I've never seen someone that's projected as well as Jack Lacocious. I can't take back that comment. I, I was saying at that time, he's the best I've seen. And I can't take back that comment. He was absolutely on that level, and he looked like a Jack Lacocious with a kick on a level I've never seen before. So, um, yeah, so being that sort of Nick Rewalt caliber sort of endurance type, covering the ground like that, and then having his kick, he really should have been able to become a great key forward, but really his, I guess, had to settle behind the ball just because Gold Coast haven't been able to get that out of him, sadly. So... Um, in his first year, the second half, he moved into defense and he's really mostly stayed there since. Um, first half of this year, he was on a wing and to his credit, looked really good there as well, but nonetheless still had his flaws. So they've put him back into defense just because he didn't really have the contested components that they were looking for to play that position. So, um, but yeah, certainly one of, I guess, the better young players in the competition, one of the best general defenders, but again, and look, this is year three. Year four is when you expect the big guys to break out. But if Lacocious isn't going to become one of the best players in the competition, well, that's just an epic fail in terms of player development right there. Because you've just got no idea how good this guy was as a junior and how good his game projected. Pick three, Isaac Rankin. Well, uh, he was 
second on my board behind Lukosius in 2018. He was an absolute machine, whether it's midfield, forward, just so influential in terms of impact per possession. And, well, he's been dropped by Gold Coast. So the fact that that can happen, he hasn't developed at all really for Gold Coast meaningfully, well, that's just a sad outcome. And a continuation of this theme, as with those players past, that just haven't developed for Gold Coast. And Ben King, well, he's been passed by Max pretty comfortably this year, I'd say, in terms of as that contested marking force. His, his contested marking numbers would be around half of what Max's are. And look, in, in fairness, he's still a, an excellent key forward and someone you'd build around any day of the week. But with that said, he's not really developing to the level that would be expected of someone of his insane talent. So... Um, really hope for Ben that he can keep improving and get better. And I hope for Gold Coast's sake, they can really put some veterans around these guys and some more capable, experienced players. So 2019, so Matt Rowell, out of the blocks, first four games, the preseason games, just absolute machine, dominated. Um, but of course, went down with the injuries, can't help that. It's good to see him back playing footy now at least, but he's not like he's not looking like the player he was when he came out of the blocks. And look, absolute professional, hard worker. He'll do everything in his power to get back to being the player he was plus. But um, again, Gold Coast don't really have those sort of veterans around him. They don't have those mentors. They need that, whether it's like a Trent Cotchin or just someone to help these young guys. I beg of them. So pick two, Noah Anderson. To his credit, he's going great, and he's improving. So Gold Coast have an improver here. So that's something. So really good young mid, credit to him. But can he become one of the great midfielders in the competition? With Gold Coast player development as it's working out, because again, they don't have that core of veteran leaders, well, there's some questions around whether he can, and I'm not so sure that he will. He not saying he can't be an All-Australian, but I don't think he'll necessarily become a top say five mid in the competition it's going to be an uphill battle so and it could be a bit like with a tom lynch where maybe he's just so talented he can but yeah gee it's going to be hard um and sam flanders pick 11 well this guy was a machine so in his draft year he played same team as caleb sarong he was arguably the better footballer and then of course caleb sarong wins the rising star in his in his first year and Flanders well he barely gets a game doesn't really look up to the pace of it in that first year um, so really given that they haven't really developed him all that well either and of course with Flanders he had that finals game where on the same ground you had Raul Anderson of course Sarong on the same team and Flanders had this one quarter where he was comfortably better than anyone on the field so um, again danger signs and Gold Coast really haven't turned it around yet and then 2010, pick seven, Elijah Hollands. So, um, of course, coming back from that injury, we'll, we'll certainly be seeing more of him next year. And fingers crossed that he can develop and hopefully Gold Coast can put the pieces around to ensure he develops. So how many of these have succeeded on a level beyond their draft expectations? So Dion Prestia, I'd say possibly, if not probably. Um, has sort of exceeded that mark. Tom Lynch, definitely. But the problem is both of them are playing for Richmond now. So Gold Coast were drafting them for themselves. But um, again, without those core pieces, without having a competitive squad, well, they're going to go to other teams. And go home factor will set in if you're going to be a bad team and you're not going to have that winning culture. That's just the reality of things. So, um, and Jack Bowes, look, he may live up to the expectation of his draft position, but again, he was an academy player, so um, and they were going to get him anyway. And ultimately, those drafted in 2018 and later still have chances to live up to their draft billing, but it's looking pretty clear in looking at the names taken. Gold Coast haven't succeeded. They haven't succeeded in developing talent to expectation, and they haven't succeeded in retaining talent either. And when you've got a bad team without established players and without a core of veteran leaders, this is the result that can be expected. And Gold Coast are at a stage in their development where you sort of would be expecting most of their better players to have been sort of to have come through the draft where they've had all these high picks. But really, in reality, a lot of them have actually been acquired from other teams, whether it's a Jared Witts, 
Hugh Greenwood, Lockie Weller, Brandon Ellis, or in the case of the likes of a Sam Collins, he was on another team's list and he was out of the league for one year. And then I guess through the concessions given by the AFL, they've got him. So, and that was after that historic season where he was just intercepting like mad. So, um, yeah, so they really need to prove that they can develop their own players. And it's looking likely that it's going to take added veteran leadership and really more good established players added to allow this to happen to enable a more positive future for those drafted in 2018 and beyond because those guys still have a chance to develop into great players. But um, yeah, it's not looking as likely as it really should have based on the absolute incredible talent there. So um, yeah, so despite the exceptional talent drafted over the years, the develop for the most part really has been a lot slower going than expected. And of course, if those dynamics don't turn around and that core of established players and veteran leaders doesn't grow, well, as we saw with Tom Lynch and Stephen May, who obviously became very good, well, you can expect another exodus of Gold Coast best young talents. So, And then they'll be starting from basic for a third time, which should be a pretty sad outcome. So um, that's the update for Gold Coast. Sorry to be doom and gloom, Gold Coast fans, but... Um, That's the reality, and that's what really needs to be turned around because it doesn't matter how many early picks you've got. If you don't have those veteran leaders, and Gold Coast might be the best example of that, well, you can't develop talent, and they're not going to want to stay either if they do develop into really good pieces. So that's the story there. So to take a look at Greater Western Sydney. So in 2012, they came 18th of 18 sides, so that shouldn't come as a surprise. So... And they had three co-captains. They had Luke Power, Callan Ward, Phil Davis. And, of course, Power was the veteran at that time. So no players aged between 25 and 28, but there were four aged 32 or older. So that's one of the more bizarre age demographic problems that you can have with no one in that age group. So, um, And that greatly hurt competitiveness at that early point in time. So... Um, And at this point, of course, they've got the 18th oldest list, so by far the youngest, and an average age of 21.3. So (laughs) it's pretty incredible there. So um, 2013, they came 18th again. So two co-captains now, so it's just Ward and Davis. And they've got the two players aged 32 or older. You've got, again, the 18th oldest list, and you've got an average age of 21.4. So in 2014, this is where things change and for the better. And these are the steps that enable Greater Western Sydney to become competitive. So they do come 16th of 18, and there's a good reason for it. So although they've only got one player aged 29 or older, and that does mean they're now inadequate in terms of veteran leadership, what they've at least done to their credit is, at this point in time, they added some key players who can really help with the competitiveness. So adding Shane Mumford and Heath Shaw to Greater Western Sydney. So for me, those two were really, I guess, the heart and soul sort of pieces that really drove the standards where you've got Mumford through the midfield who makes all the midfielders stand taller and look better. And then you've got Heath Shaw in defence who he loves being outspoken and loves running the defence. So that worked a treat as well. And then Ryan Griffin, who Greater Western Sydney got in that trade for Tom Boyd, in that trade to Bulldogs. So again, another sort of experienced player who had the runs on the board and another piece the young guys can learn off of. Well, this is what supercharged Greater Western Sydney's development and saw their youth in 2014 and those years following on start to make some progress and ground. So that was great seeing those names added. So... And here they've still got the 18th oldest list, an average age of 22. So still a very young group, but at least they're adding those competitive components, which is so vital. So 2015, so they come 11th of 18. So only one player aged 30 or older, which is Joel Patful. Um, 18th oldest list, an average age of 22.5. And then 2016, this is the year they make the big jump. And it's the year where everyone was really, or at least I was thinking this, and I imagine there would have been a lot of people in the industry thinking this, where at this point in time, you're thinking Greater Western Sydney have the best list in the competition and the most desirable. And if I could have any one list, I would take Greater Western Sydney's. 
And I would say for even a few years after that, Greater Western Sydney still had the best list. So, um, and so they came fourth of 18. So three players aged 30 or older. So Steve Johnson was added from Geelong. So great addition, veteran, they needed that. Another piece. So they had the 17th oldest list. So first time their average age is actually past the 23 mark. So an average age of 23.4. So they're coming into competitiveness and having such a young list that's already a top four side. Well, you have to be thinking premierships. Multiple, not just one. But of course that isn't to be. So... 2017 again they come fourth out of 18 so these are all the home and away home and away season finishes so this doesn't include finals so they have seven players aged 30 or older so now they're at a point where okay they're they've actually got a core of veterans and 2017 you'd be thinking this team should be winning a premiership this year but of course not to be so second oldest list so that's a huge jump right they're going from 17th the year before up to second oldest and that's for an average age of 24.5 so um and really from that point onwards their average age hasn't changed a lot although there are some other teams that have changed slightly around them interestingly so um 2018 they come seventh of 18 so poor finish just with all the list quality that's no wonder players have really been exiting and there, there have still nonetheless been other problems, such as you've got really, I guess, a large cohort of players that all want to play one position and aren't well-suited to others. So there have been those list holes in that respect. But nonetheless, with the sheer talent, much better should have been expected. Um, but again, they haven't always had that veteran leadership and there haven't always been those pieces there to really help support them in those competitive age groups. So having such an over-reliance on youth and so many in that same age group, well, you can't sign them all. And then it's hard to develop them all at the same time. So um, in 2018, so still it's three players aged over 30. So that's good. But um, fifth oldest list, average age of 24.2. So um, 2019, they came sixth out of the 18 sides, but they did make the grand final. But of course, they absolutely got demolished. By Richmond so four players aged 30 or over seventh oldest list average age of 24.2 so um, they were knocking on the door of the premiership but yeah wasn't to be 2020 they came 10th out of 18 and you've got seven players aged 30 or over Stephen Cornelio he assumes captaincy They've got the sixth oldest list and an average age of 24.7. So, and 2021, well, at the time of producing this, they're at, at 12th out of the 18, so 18 rounds into the season. And they've got six players aged 30 or over, seventh oldest list, average age of 24.5. So, um, yeah, it's just really been an unfortunate journey, I guess you could say, for greater western sydney and they haven't really been able despite all these first round picks to really i guess become that premiership team and when we go through the names there's some real names here and there's an incredible number of early picks but if you don't have those veteran pieces and those experienced players for the young guys to learn off of it's a harder journey than it should be and you don't always get there and as we've seen with Greater Western Sydney, well, a lot of them have left. Whether it's they can't get the money they want, they want to go home, not competitive enough. You just can't have that many high picks in that same age group. You just can't sign them all. It's not possible. So their draft history. So, and again, these are just your top 15 picks or equivalent of. So they had the access to the 12, 17 year olds and there were some whopping big names here. So Jeremy Cameron, Dylan Scheel, Adam Trelaw, Jack Homsch, Tom Bug, Nathan Wilson, Tim Golds, Sam Darley, Josh Groden, Jared Harding, Simon Tunbridge, and Jared Eugle. So none of them remain with Greater Western Sydney. And we've got some stars there. Cameron Shield, Trelaw, Wilson's pretty good. Bug had a few years and Homsch is still going around. So there's still some names there. But Greater Western Sydney couldn't retain them all. 2011. So we've got pick one, John Patton, pick two, Stephen Cornelio, pick three, Dom Tyson, pick four, Will Hoskin Elliott, pick five, Matthew Buntine. Gee, 
not surprising these guys haven't really fully developed given the lack of veterans and at some stages and on those particularly early years lack of really those established players for these guys to learn off of so pick seven this is a success at least nick hayes pick nine adam tomlinson pick 10 liam sumner pick 11 toby green great pick probably their franchise player at the moment um pick 13 taylor adams pick 14 devon smith so at least we've got a few names here so 2012 pick one Lockie whitfield solid pick so we can see a difference already between greater western sydney and gold coast where at least at stages greater western sydney have had those veterans particularly early days and then they've had that competitive core led by in particular mumford and shaw who for me really for greater western sydney were those driving forces so pick two john o'rourke that was a failure to develop pick three Lockie plowman yikes pick 12 christian jacks again out of the competition not good enough didn't develop um, pick 14, Aiden Core, reasonable piece, is still running around, though not in Greater Western Sydney colours, of course, anymore. Um, 2013, pick 1, Tom Boyd. Pick 2, Josh Kelly. Pick 14, Cam McCarthy. Um, so Kelly was fine, but yeah, and he's signing that long-term deal, so at least they're able to keep him. But really at the strike rate greater western sydney are going you can have three top picks and they're only really going to be keeping one over the long run so um yeah so 2014 you've got pick four jared pickett pick six caleb marchbank and you've got pick seven paul way hearn so yeah none of those guys are there anymore none of them have really had that great success for the giants um yeah, so you've got 2015, so you've got um, Jacob Hopper, so he was academy pick, and you've got Matthew Kennedy at 13, who, again, academy pick. Kennedy, of course, with Carlton now these days. So, um, And look, Hopper, great pick, but he was worth more than pick seven, ultimately, and should have been bid on a lot earlier for those who were draft savvy and really followed that draft. Um, you've got 2016, so pick two, Tim Taranto. Um, pick five, you've got Will Setterfield, and then you've got um, pick 14, you've got Perryman. So, um, yeah, with Taranto, at least, you've got someone who is competitive for his pick. Setterfield, look, he's had his injuries, but he hasn't really developed, and Perryman's a piece, so that's something there. Um, and, of course, he was academy. And then you've got 2017, you've got um, pick 11, Aidan Bonner, failure to develop, no longer there. Um, 2018, we've got two more that have left, funnily. You've got Jai Coldwell and Jackson Haightley, so they didn't stay around long. And why that happened? Well, Greater Western Sydney had a real glut of midfielders. They had too many midfielders, not enough in other positions. So um, they really needed to address their team chemistry there and really find that balance around the field. 2019, pick four, Lockie Ash. Um, pick 10, Tom Green, bargain there. Um, bid on far too late. Um, 2020, so you've got Tanner Brun, and then you've got pick 15, Connor Stone. So um, really looking at Greater Western Sydney's story and whether they've lived up to expectations, well, you've got Nick Haynes. Um, he's, he far exceeded my expectations, that's for sure, and he's developed into a really good piece. Tom, Toby Green, fantastic. Um, Taylor Adams, Devin Smith, again, fantastic, but unfortunately they're on other lists. So they all represent really good value for where they were picked. Um, of the next sort of generation coming through, I guess you could say Tom Green, he looks great and he could join that group of real genuine successes, although he's through the academy. And then while the likes of, you could say, Cornelio, Whitfield, Kelly, and you can look at Hopper as well as an academy pick, well, they've all lived up to expectations. So at least there have been a few and at least they've been able to retain some but um yeah with that said though there's still been a lot more misses than is ideal and importantly to note as well a lot of list turnover in the form of players wanting out which really shows how much early draft pick talent put together isn't really a recipe for success as people would sort of assume is the case where you'd look at all the names that have been drafted in the first round and you'd be thinking with all these picks, surely it's going to mean multiple premierships and something pretty scary. But ultimately it wasn't able to yield one and they've just been really losing a lot of talent. So 
Um, it's really an unfortunate outcome and unfortunately it hasn't proved quite to be the way to build the list that Greater Western Sydney would have envisaged. So, um, and what they really needed, so they needed a larger core of established players and veteran leaders to really support and aid the development of their most talented young players where they didn't need as many young players as they had. They really needed a better ratio of established players at some stages and really the veteran leaders to support them, which at the start, of course, they had the leaders without the established players and then they got the established players without the leaders to fully maximize that product ultimately and build that winning culture. So, um, and with really a historic number of first round picks in as many years and high first round picks at that, um, yeah, it just didn't really result in anything. The Giants couldn't even win one premiership. And with their current group, it doesn't look like this current group will get there either. So um, yeah, the Giants will, over the next few years, need to really address their list imbalance firstly, because they've got a lot of midfielders and they've still got a decent group of key position players, but they really need to fill their other needs around the field to really look like a good team. So they need to bring in good players to fill in those holes and build a team if they want to really take this group to contend. So, and maybe that means giving up some good players in the process in those spots where they've got a surplus of a particular type. Um, yeah, because you just can't have that many, in particular, ball-winning mids. They just You can't fit that many on the same team. So when you've got the likes of Green, Hopper, Taranto, there's just too much replication. So, um, yeah, that's something the Giants will have to figure out. And... Um, yeah, so basically in going through this process and this analysis, the points that I hope have become fairly obvious is that certainly veteran leadership is a big deal, but it's the, the other point as well is that first round picks and early picks, well, it doesn't really materialize into success unless you really have those quality veteran leaders and established players around them or you just can't develop that culture, can't develop that winning culture. Whatever you do, you don't want to tank because that's going to create that losing culture and the player development won't come along regardless of how much talent you bring in. We saw that through those Carlton years and those Melbourne years of all these early picks not nearly living up to the level of expectation expected. And of course, with Gold Coast, without ever having those veteran leaders and Gary Ablett really not being adequate as a captain and having that support around him because he was never really that natural leader, great of a talent as he was. So um, that's really the key point there where you need those established players, veteran leaders, or it doesn't matter how much youth you bring in and how early they were picked. It's not really enough to help a list have success and develop into a great team. 